Um, I won't start with a joke, but I will uh, say that in listening to Lindsay's uh, presentation, I was struck by the Disney story. Um, 20 years ago, maybe more, uh, I had an experience at Disney World, Disney World Florida. Uh, I was with a family event. There were about 20 of us. We had spent a day in Universal Studios and a day in Disney. And what we noticed was that Disney was cleaner than Universal. In particular, the ground was cleaner. Um, we kept noticing in Universal the, all the wrappings of things that uh, the kids would be eating would be on the ground, and ice cream on the ground. And I, so I commented to an ice cream vendor in Disney, why is it that your ice cream is not on the ground in the same way it is at Universal? And what I was told was, the reason is because we freeze our ice cream based on how long it's going to take a child to consume it. And it's a little more frozen than Universal's. And that kind of planning, that kind of thoughtful innovation carries through in what they do. And you know, frankly, I think it's uh, very germane to the subject I want to talk about today as well. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Phil Silverman. I am the Chief Physical Assets Officer at the North Shore Long Island Jewish Healthcare System, which, um, as some of you in this room may know, uh, is going to become Northwell Health uh, in January. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, quite a few of my colleagues uh, because we thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas and to talk about uh, the future of healthcare, the needs of healthcare. And so uh, we have folks on the real estate side with us. We have folks on the capital project uh, delivery side. Uh, we work in a very team-based environment. Uh, and uh, I know we're definitely looking forward to getting to know people here uh, in the room with us. We have, um, we have some big plans. And uh, we want to tell you about them. So we've been going through a metamorphosis, metamorphosis at North Shore. Um, the world is very different to us today than it was only a few years ago. And when we look at that slide, oh, I've got it right here. When I look at this slide, I can say that um, we have taken a leap. And one of the things that I want to talk about today is you know, the potential for others to do some of what we're doing in their own portfolios. Because if we all do it together, and I'll come back to that, I think it's going to be very, very impactful. We work in a world where we appreciate collaboration. Uh, what I would say is that uh, we innovate through partnership in our own organizations all the time. Uh, we uh, create spaces where people can connect with each other. We build differently. We build with open plans today. Uh, we have communal rooms. We're very aware of the fact that we need to share what's in our brain with the next person's brain. And, and yet, when it comes to uh, counterparty transactions, to the work that we do every day with suppliers uh, and vendors and landlords in particular, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, for the most part, uh, we are on opposite sides of the table, and it stays that way. So maybe uh, the thing I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about how I got here and why this is such an interesting topic for me. Um, so I grew up in a house where my parents only wanted me to become an attorney. That was what I had to do. And I was the dutiful son, sort of. Uh, I agreed that I would go to law school after college. But um, I agreed to go at night so that I could pursue my passion. Well, not exactly my passion, but I did want to go into real estate. And shopping center development seemed like the way to get there. And so uh, that is what I did. I spent about 10 years uh, building shopping centers in the Northeast, some office buildings, some industrial buildings, but essentially uh, 10 years doing the same thing. And what I found is that I had a growing um, dissatisfaction with my life. Uh, it was hard to explain exactly what it was, but uh, I felt that there was no mission. Well, there was one mission, and that was it. You know, and, and, and I have to say that money is mission for many people. I'm guessing not the people in this room, because we're all engaged in mission-driven work. But you know, in the world at large, uh, this is the mission, and we are encouraged uh, to make as much as we can and as quickly as we can. And that is certainly true in real estate. For me, something was missing. Um, I had grown up uh, as a child in a home with a very ill parent. 
Uh, my mom died when I was 12. And had I been in the position where I could have become a doctor, if I had an aptitude for that, um, you know, that might have been what I went to. But business was sort of where I ended up. And I remember very distinctly in, uh, in uh, Christmas of 2000, uh, I was at an event. We were all watching uh, the Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, which is inspirational. The guy is definitely looking to, to have the world be a, a more benevolent world. And you know, it was an inspirational moment for me. I decided I wanted to make a change. And that spring, uh, I, uh, I did make that change. And so um, I joined the administration of Columbia University. And I spent uh, 12 years at Columbia. I will say that this was in May of 2001. And so uh, there was a world-changing moment only four months after I joined, which was 9-11. Uh, I was with colleagues, uh, many of whom are, a few of whom are in this room with us today. And um, we watched literally on video monitors uh, aghast as we watched the second uh, crash into the second tower. And uh, that was, the, my, I guess, my Kool-Aid moment. I said, this is my life's work. I really want to do this. I want to make the world a place where there will be more room for education, research, tolerance. You know, what can we do to change the world? Uh, and at that moment in time, Columbia was very ambitious. It had a plan to develop a new uh, 7 million square foot, $7 billion campus, which is rising today. And so it was exciting and uh, really, really enjoyable. So um, this is a quote I love. Um, this quote uh, hangs on my wall, and it is something that I refer to all the time. Uh, that, that those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by other people who are doing it. The first time I saw it, uh, I was a kid. It was on a poster, and it was of a skier leaping off a mountain and going over the heads of all the people below him looking up. And I find this quote to be so true uh, in terms of intentionality. So now we get to the North Shore story. So I joined North Shore LIJ um, three years ago. Uh, we're a system of 21 hospitals. We have roughly 14 million square feet of space, about 4.5 million of which is off campus. Um, we are 61,000 employees. We're the largest employer in the state of New York, largest private employer. When I got there, I was told that uh, my job uh, was going to be uh, real estate, capital project delivery, and operations for our uh, hospitals and off-campus spaces. And um, I was also told that although I have a real estate background, there wasn't much to do in real estate. That, that work had pretty much been done by people. And that what I needed to concentrate on really was the delivery of construction projects. But you know, maybe there's a little bit of real estate to be done. And I suspect that for many of the people in this room, uh, people could say the same thing about your uh, organizations as well. So uh, this is what I found. Um, on the screen here, this is North Shore University Hospital. Uh, it's one of our two tertiary uh, campuses on Long Island. And this is uh, Long Island Jewish Medical Center. Uh, those two hospitals uh, sort of represent uh, the nexus of the system. Uh, we do have, obviously, other tertiaries, but these were the two biggest. And that there were actually 53 sites within a mile or a mile and a half of these two hospitals uh, with an, a median square footage of about 14,000 feet. And every one of those sites, except for one, where there was a donor, uh, was being leased at a prevailing market rate. And by prevailing market rate, I essentially mean that a Broker comes in and tells a, uh, a person on the administration that we found the space for you. This is how much the landlord wants to charge for it. And you negotiate over a very little bit of money. And essentially, the landlord makes the deal they want to make. So how do you get there? Why does that happen? Why are we so, why are we so indebted to our landlords is the question I keep asking. And, and I think it's half a dozen different things. One is capital conservation. We don't want to necessarily spend all the money to develop these facilities. 
So we use landlords who will turnkey it for us. They make it easy. They make the leases easy to sign. I mean, they're in this business. It's kind of simple. They, they provide us with a solution at a moment in time when we have a need. We end up with entrenched sites. We end up with sites that grow over time, kind of almost like a fungus. You've got a footprint here, and there's more space requirement, and someone says, well, we can get another floor, or we can solve a problem, and the landlord's you know, happy to accommodate. We have controlled inventory. You know, business people are smart. They say, well, there are hospitals here, and there's going to be increasing demand for these uh, needs. We're going to buy up all the buildings in the area, and they're going to have to come to us, because where else are they going to go? They need to be close to their hospitals. And then you have, you know, the natural decanting of hospitals. It's been discussed already a couple times in the room today that we're in an environment that is becoming more ambulatory. Hospitals are being repurposed and renovated. More things are being pulled out of the hospitals. So if you own real estate around the hospitals, you know, sort of by definition, you're going to get your share of the business. And that's exactly what was happening. Um, for us, the way I looked at it is it's a portfolio that we didn't create but that we inherited. And there was a strong bias against change. So this was the opportunity. Um, right here, whoops, sorry, how do I go back? Can this go backwards? There we go. OK. So uh, this is a uh, very, very large building. It's 1.3 million square feet of space. It's one of the buildings that actually uh, can be seen from outer space. It was the original home to the United Nations. And it happens to sit in between our two ter tertiary hospitals. So a great location, uh, the, for the most part, fully occupied. Um, and we said, well, it's a great asset, but how do we get control of it? And, and the story, which I'm going to uh, tell in just a minute, is that what we said we wanted to do is we wanted to create a sense of place. We wanted to create an environment of collaboration. We wanted to have a, an opportunity for phased occupancy, very important for us. As everyone in this room knows, you know, the programs come online slowly, and then sometimes they grow quickly, and you have to adjust to this. So we needed to have flexibility. Occupancy cost reduction was critically important to us. Uh, we were successful in achieving almost a 30% reduction in our occupancy costs uh, for this quantity of space. And of course, most importantly, we had to take a look at our time horizon. We've got two tertiary hospitals, one on either side. They've been in business for 40 or 50 years. Nothing's going to replace them. So we have an infinite time horizon and therefore, unlike all of the other buildings where we were paying landlords rent forever and never acquiring the asset, we needed to have a path to ownership. So we had to change the conversation. And change is not easy. I, this was a cartoon that uh, someone gave to me. Uh, people love innovation, but they're kind of afraid of it because it hasn't been done before. And so you know, we said, we want to be different. How do we, how do, we do that? And so, there were a lot of factors involved here. Uh, we needed to come up with a way to control the site. Uh, we needed to have optionality uh, so that uh, if it did, things didn't work out as planned, there was a fallback. Uh, we needed to build consensus. Um, I don't know how many people work in an organization that is matrix management as opposed to top-down management. We're matrixed. So what, what I say that means is, in theory, you work for one person. But everybody else has a voice in what you do. And it's a little bit like riding a bicycle, where people on either side of you have, spoke, uh, have twigs. They throw them into the spokes as you go by, and they flip you over the handlebars. It, it's a hard way to, to build consensus, but it has to be done. And so you need time to do that, which means you need flexibility in terms of your deal. You need a, uh, a solution to a public approvals process that most landlords will not will not give you. you know, they want to know you're locked in even before you know you can deliver uh, what you need to be able to deliver in the space. And then you have existing tenancies to deal with. You have your tenancies. You have the tenancies of the people that are already in the space you want to occupy. There were a lot of things involved. And I had my, my moment when I was standing in the middle of the facility trying to negotiate with the, with the ownership of that facility. And I watched another developer walk in and shake hands with somebody else on the ownership's team. And I thought to myself, they're going to take this deal away from us. 
It's right in the middle of our area. It's our market. We belong there. And somebody else is smart enough to figure out they want to get there first. And we did not let that happen. So this is where we are today. Um, this is Long Island Jewish Medical Center. This is our corporate headquarters. And this is a facility that we will, over time, fill up with the uh, Center for Advanced Medicine, which is currently actually operating, um, a Center for Learning and Innovation, that's our corporate university, uh, one of the largest of its kind, a conference center, uh, laboratory facilities, bioskills facilities, uh, indoor parking, and a large mix of clinical and administrative uses. Uh, folks uh, heard this morning from you know, the Cleveland Clinic and uh, what they've accomplished in terms of a sense of place, and it's inspiring. And we said we needed to have that for ourselves. But we needed to have it in a way that we could uh, develop on a human scale and develop it over time. And so we've begun that process. Uh, we've opened the, the first sections of the facility. Uh, we've taken a large building and we've made it a, uh, a building that is uh, user friendly. Um, and we've done it um, you know, through partnership. So what do I mean by that? So there is a, general, a, a um, generational approach to real estate. Uh, most people say, I have it. I want to pass it on to my children. They'll pass it on to their children. They don't want to part with their real estate. We needed to convince a developer to give us a, to take a smaller piece of a better pie. And we really set out to say, who can we partner with? And so we said, we need a developer who wants to share, doesn't want to compete. We need a developer who is interested in uh, our objectives, not just their own objectives. We need a developer who will work with our timeline. In essence, one of my colleagues said to me this week, there's this great quote by Gandhi, which is, be the change you want to see. And uh, we've adapted that. And essentially, we said we need to invent. We need to create the developer that we want to have. And, and that's what we did in this particular deal. And so I want to just talk about the impact slide for a minute. This blue line represents the trajectory of our rents had we done nothing. Uh, the steep portion is essentially the decanting of our existing facilities into the new facility. What's, um, what it compares to is the green line below it, which is the transaction that we accomplished. And effectively, uh, we were able to, at the end of the day, with a uh, very, very complex transaction, and it, it did take a lot of work and it took a lot of partnership, we were able to uh, achieve, just in a rental portfolio, $120 million of net present value savings on a single transaction. And that has become the model from which we're operating. And those are the kinds of transactions that we're seeking as we go forward. And so, you know, in summing up, what I would say is we're excited about this. We, we think that there are you know, hundreds, literally, if not more, projects in healthcare that deserve this sort of treatment. And we think that the people in this room, frankly, are the very same people that need to implement the ideas that we're implementing because we need to do this together. That, that if we become the reason for the change, if we change the conversation with all of the providers that are out there, they're gonna have to listen. We have only one voice. Each of you has a voice, but together we have a very, very loud voice. And we believe that in healthcare, the mission of what we're doing, the credit quality of who we are, the communities that we serve, and the stability that we offer should allow us to change the conversation in real estate, change the conversation with the developers, and essentially deliver more money back to our healthcare systems to do the work that we're here to do in the first place. Thank you.